In May 2015, Anthony Johnson lost the biggest fight of his career, a title fight against Daniel Cormier. Inside the opening 30 seconds, Rumble almost took DC's fucking head off with a thunderous right hand. Throughout the fight, Rumble landed a number of those vicious trademark strikes we've seen smash the consciousness out of many previous opponents. There were a couple of head kicks that left Cormier looking straight up fucking flabbergasted. But to his credit, Cormier hung in there, weathered the storm, wore Rumble down, and submitted an exhausted, gasping beast in the third round. Although his disappointment was palpable, Rumble managed to control his emotions and offered a refreshingly upbeat and philosophical message in his post-fight interview. Thank you everybody for coming out. I love you all. Tonight I might have lost, but the one thing I want you guys to remember is that you should never give up. Like I said before, I was pushed down to the bottom and I worked my way up to the top. I want you all to know that no matter what comes your way in life, never give up. Keep pushing, because nothing can stop you but you. In the post-fight press conference, he added sincere congratulations to Cormier. I can't take anything away from Daniel. I'm happy for him, I'm proud of him, and I wish him nothing but success. It was really no surprise that Anthony didn't lament or feel sorry for himself in a post-fight. Embedded in the long story of his unconventional career was already an emphatic lesson that your worst nightmare could turn out to be an epic blessing in disguise. In fact, in AJ's case, a silver lining on a dark, dark cloud shaped his entire childhood. AJ was a fifth of 10 children, born to an alcoholic father and a mother struggling with a drug addiction. His childhood looked set to unfold in an unstable, overcrowded, and very likely an explosive environment. But at the age of two, he somehow suffered burns all over his body. The source of the injury remains unclear, but regardless, the net result of the whole thing was that his grandparents felt the need to intervene. They took AJ in and ultimately adopted him. And so the first huge break of AJ's life came ironically in the form of a full body burn. Because the one sentiment he has constantly reiterated over the years is gratitude towards his grandparents for taking him in and providing a healthy, stable environment for him to thrive and grow up. I've spoken about the relationship Khabib has with his father, Tyson with Customato. Well, although there's no quotes or footage of the man, AJ has given us enough to surmise this type of bond with his granddad. He was a music Rumble had to face whenever he fucked up. He once got caught forging his granddad's signature on a school report. The teacher called his grandparents, and as AJ says, she signed my death certificate right there. I love that phrase. She signed his motherfucking death certificate. The sky was falling, the walls are closing in. Time seems to speed up, because there's an impending ass whooping just waiting for you at home. For Rumble, it was that tough, old-fashioned, boot-up-the-fucking-ass-type discipline administered by his granddad that helped keep him on a straight and narrow as a kid. I believe the phrase is tough love. His granddad also introduced him to wrestling and encouraged him in this sport. My granddad took me to my first wrestling practice when I was eight years old. I had no idea where he was taking me, but he took me to my first wrestling practice at the gym at my old middle school. That's when I started, and from day one, I loved it. In an interview with Brett Okamoto in 2015, Brett described that Rumble still had difficulty discussing his granddad's passing, which had happened eight years prior in 2007. But the little he has said about it speaks volumes about the nature of their relationship. Every year, I write him the day he died every year. When I write him, I'm writing as if he's like 10 miles away, our next state, just like a regular letter. I just kind of tell him about what's been going on the last year. It's almost like I'm having a discussion with him at some point, like face to face. 
Just tell him everybody's doing good and the family's okay and I'm doing great. And hope he's doing okay. It definitely lifts a lot of pressure or weight off my shoulders. Whenever I write him, a lot of things have built up over the year that I don't have a chance to talk to anybody else about because I don't feel I'm comfortable enough to talk to anybody else about. But I feel like I can always talk to him, and I just kind of let it out when I talk to him. Just that one day of the year, and that's it. Every time I get ready to fight, I talk to him before. That's quite a moving quote from Rumble. But... I'm not going into this just to pull in your heartstrings. I honestly think seeing these dynamics and the positive forces that shaped fighters' lives is one of the great things MMA celebrates. Although it's often taken for granted, I don't think there's a more powerful motivator in a child or adolescent's life than a positive role model who takes a genuine interest in a child's development. The drive to impress uh, you know, make proud the people who selflessly invested a huge part of themselves into your growth, that can be an enormous force for good in a child's life. Obviously, it applies to all of us. We all got here somehow. If you were lucky, you had someone like that in your life, take an interest in you. But the origin stories of average people are very seldom examined, and almost never publicly. Whereas, the origin stories of fighters are often examined at length, and the positive forces that transform their lives are offered up in great detail. That recurring theme, the transformative effect of a sincere role model, uh, you know, a mentor, I think that's probably the most positive lesson you're going to learn from this violent, unforgiving blood sport. And in the few interviews AJ has done on his background, That is the picture he paints. Rumble thrived on his grandparents' farm. He was a national champ in high school and college, and it was with this impressive wrestling pedigree that he ventured into MMA. Within two months of turning professional, he went 3-0, winning a welterweight tournament in a smaller organization, and he was subsequently picked up by the UFC, albeit under less than ideal circumstances. With less than a week's notice and with only three fights under his belt, Rumble was asked to step in against a 13-2 Chad Rayner. In a pre-fight promo, Rumble defiantly stated, I'm here right now because they want me to be a pushover. But I'm not. I'm nobody's bitch. And he certainly was not. Rumble went in there and smashed the fuck out of Chad in 13 seconds. It was one of those hard-to-watch knockouts that have come to characterize Johnson's career. Merciless power followed by abrupt unconsciousness. Forget about them UFC jitters. Rumble arrived with a fucking bang. He followed that up with a solid 7-3 streak at welterweight, including a number of decent wins and a couple of wicked KOs. In that streak, though, his main adversary was a weigh-in scales, and after missing weight twice, he moved up to middleweight to face Vitor Belfort. Now, apparently, Rumble actually made the 186-pound weight limit. The only slight downside of doing so was that he couldn't feel his fucking legs. Which is fairly important. I like to be able to feel all ten fingers and all ten toes pretty much all the time. I mean, anything less and, you know, I'm getting worried. And on that basis, the UFC's doctor ordered him to rehydrate, which meant he eventually weighed in a whopping 12 pounds over the limit. And he was promptly cut by the UFC. Getting cut from the UFC like that often signals the beginning of the end for a fighter. But again, looking for blessings in disguise, AJ interpreted the cut as a stern boot in the ass from Dana White, a reality check, and an opportunity for growth and to reevaluate his career. That's the best thing that ever happened to me. Two fights later, he finally debuted at a more natural weight class of light heavyweight, and the benefits were instant. He went 6-0 outside the UFC, including a win over Arlovsky, at heavyweight, which at the time seemed, you know, straight up fucking ridiculous. And shortly after, he was re-signed by the UFC. It was around this time I became aware of this little gem. 
I always call my grandmother right before I go out. She reads me a scripture from the Bible and tells me to do my best. And she always tells me not to hurt my opponent for some reason. Don't hurt that boy, because that's somebody else's baby. Now, on the one hand, that last line, don't hurt that boy, seems like a compassionate plea from a sweet old lady. But it's also hilarious when you consider Rumble's style and the unmitigated reign of terror that was about to descend on the light heavyweight division. Rumble returned and proceeded to molly whop the fuck out of half the light heavyweight division. I mean, Christ. Fucking crash, smash. Oh, oh, this is the worst one. Fucking boom. In just three fights, not only had he punched his way from World Series of Fighting into a UFC title shot, but he had also emerged as the preeminent boogeyman in the collective consciousness of MMA. There's just something sinister about the earth-shattering ultra-violence of a rumble KO. His fights should almost come with a disclaimer. Warning, the following beatdown may contain scenes that even the most fucked up, desensitized and sadistic fans could find disturbing. Brace yourself. Boom. But it wasn't to be. Cormier showed amazing grit, fought the smart fight, wore Rumble down, and tapped the fuck out of him in three. And aside from being upbeat and philosophical about the loss, Rumble made the following post-fight determination. My goal is still to be a champion one day. I was on a nine-fight win streak, and Daniel just defeated me. But I promise I'll be back. I don't care who I have to fight, when I have to fight him, or where I have to fight him. I will be back, and whoever's there, hey, let's do it. Since then, Rumble rattled off three more wicked KOs. He destroyed Jimmy Manoa, smashed the fuck out of Ryan Bader, and in another particularly violent sequence, recorded the second 13-second KO of his career over light heavyweight killer Glover Teixeira. That win has placed Rumble in a familiar old spot of trying to take the good from the bad. Because next Saturday, he has an opportunity to use what he learned in his loss to DC, combine it with the improvements he's made since, and parlay all that into a championship belt. That loss may have been just what he needed. Another opportunity for growth and reevaluation. Another epic blessing in disguise.